Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome. Today's topic is John Quincy Adams, Part 2. John Quincy Adams was the sixth U.S. president. We stopped last time in 1796. He was the U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands under President George Washington. And uh, this was his first good job. And he was you know, pretty happy to be back in Europe where he had spent much of his childhood. And, uh, and, and he, he also had time to to read books, read uh, great books of history and literature. And he, he wrote this in 1796, quote, I have not yet lost my attachment to poetical beauty and still recognize with delight the flashes of ri- orig- original genius. Shakespeare, therefore, retains almost unimpaired his empire over my mind. So uh, he, uh, in February of 1796, he found he, he was... Uh, he spent some time in London during his time in Europe, and uh, there was an American family in London that he started visiting. They had three uh, uh, daughters who were eligible, and uh, he started spending a lot of time there. And began, actually, he you know he was still single. He'd had a relationship in Boston that had didn't work out, partly in large part due to his mother's influence, who didn't didn't approve of the young lady. And uh, anyway, you know he had he had a good job, so he was thinking of marriage and. Uh, he fell in love with Louisa Johnson in London, this uh, a young lady from an, from an American family. She was the second in the family. And um, so uh, by October, he was appointed U.S. ambassador to Portugal. And in November, his father was elected U.S. president, second president of the United States. Now, the thing is, uh, he, yeah, he, he had mixed feelings about getting married. He, they were engaged, uh, but then they, they, it seems like they couldn't. Uh, he, he wouldn't set a wedding date, and uh, and uh, they, uh, Louisa and her family became impatient, and um, so and he, he you know he was going to Portugal or I believed he was going to Portugal. I wasn't sure you know if he wanted, was really ready, ready to get married or if he could support a uh, you know a family yet. At any rate, finally you know he was. This, this uh, family, the father and mother and Louisa, you know, kept pressuring him. They had kind of a turbulent uh, uh, courtship. But on July 26, 1797, uh, John Quincy and Louisa Johnson got married in London. Uh, there was no, uh, his family did not attend, and it was just her family and some, some friends in London. They, uh, they had an interesting marriage, uh, John Quincy and Louisa. They were married for more than 50 years, and... Uh, they had a stormy relationship. You know, there were he was a kind of a difficult guy to live with. He was a good man, but he was kind of troubled and uh, and uh, kind of crazy sometimes. And uh, so anyway, but they you know all in all they you know they got through those hard the hardships that they went through, and uh, you know there was a lot of love between them. And um, so so I would say that they had a good marriage, and she was she was a good wife, Louisa Johnson. And uh, they had four children, including a son, Charles, who became U.S. ambassador to Great Britain during the Civil War. Louisa, again, you know, her, she had been, I uh, believe, had spent her entire uh, life in, over in England and in Europe and had never been to the United States. Historian William Seal wrote this about Louisa uh, Johnson Adams, quote, Though a social creature, she brooded behind the scenes, often troubled by anxieties. Yeah, John Quincy and Louisa, they both had uh, their problems, you know, mental problems, you could say. I guess we all do. And, uh, and, uh, but anyway, yeah, she, 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 had, she, she, she also had depression. They both had depression on and off. Now, uh, the thing is, the, uh, the plan, plans were changed. Uh, he was, uh, it was decided that he would go to Prussia rather than Portugal in, in June of 1797. And he was kind of a, he was upset because all, actually his, he had shipped his stuff and they had shipped things to, to Portugal and now they're supposed to go to Berlin. You know, Prussia is now a part of Germany. So this was, uh, this is what happened. Now after the wedding, shortly, not long after the wedding, her, Louisa's parents uh, sailed to the United States and they, uh, John, John Quincy had the impression that uh, she, this was a very wealthy family, and he, he anticipated eventually coming back to the U.S. and living the life of an intellectual gentleman farmer, you know, reading books and sort of not, not being pressured to make money. But uh, the thing is, her father, Luisa's father, had severe financial problems that nobody knew about except him. And shortly after uh, he left, he and his wife left and sailed to the U.S., these creditors started coming 
to the to the place where the home where uh, John Quincy and Louisa were staying, and all the, there was all these bills that had not been paid, and this was very very troubling. And then you know John Quincy realized that he was not going to be able to live a life of ease and um, and uh, being just read books, which actually was worked out okay because you know he was a very hard working guy and ambitious to to achieve. Uh, but this was very hard on Louisa, you know, her father, whom she admired. She was haunted for the rest of her life by this, uh, by his, her father's financial collapse. Anyway, so the couple, John Quincy and Louisa, by November they arrived in Berlin, Prussia, and as John Quincy was the U.S. ambassador there, she had a she had a miscarriage uh, shortly, uh, sometime after they arrived, and almost died. So this was this was tough. In fact, she had she had quite a few miscarriages, and they were you know heartbroken naturally because they wanted to have a family. Now the uh, the Queen of Prussia, uh, you know, learned about this miscarriage and you know that they were sort of in mourning and how sad uh, Louisa felt, and so she uh, gave her some uh, rouge. You know, rouge is this uh, makeup that women put on their cheeks. Now the thing is, uh, John Quincy was had very strong opinions of right and wrong. And he, he thought, you know, that um, wearing makeup, especially rouge, was, uh, he considered this, a bad woman would wear something like this. It was not acceptable for a good woman. And he had very, yeah, he, this was one of his problems in life. His ideas of right and wrong were very strong. And uh, he was very intolerant of when people uh, uh, broke the rules that he believed in. So anyway, uh, this, uh, the Queen of Prussia had uh, given... Uh, Louisa, some rouge, which she put on before they were going to go to a party. And uh, um, John Quincy had a fit, and he forbade her from using it. And she put it on anyway. This is a very ugly scene. She put on this rouge, and he scrubbed it off with a wet towel. You know, very, very unfortunate. And it was, it was fashionable at the time in Berlin. So this was, you know, early in their marriage. And uh, so anyway, he was uh, there in Berlin, Prussia. And there wasn't much work to do. He was studying German and became fluent. In February, uh, he got news that he had given Charles, his brother, younger brother Charles, $4,000 to invest for him. And the money was gone because Charles, you know, is actually uh, on the road to death through alcoholism, his brother. So he got news that this money was gone. So this was very troubling because, you know, he's a young guy starting married, married life. And, and uh, that was a lot of money for that time. In July of 1798, uh, Louisa had her second miscarriage. The following year, in April of 1799, her third miscarriage. So this was, it was very tough, all these miscarriages, you know, because they were hoping to have a family, and this is, this is really the death of a child. Uh, by July of 1798, John Quincy was able to sign a treaty between the United States and Prussia. That same year, 1799, John Singleton Copley painted this outstanding portrait of John Quincy when he, as a young man, that uh, it's on the cover of the Harlow Giles Unger biography, one of the, one of the best uh, uh, portraits of John Quincy Adams. In January of 1800, uh, Louisa had her fourth miscarriage. Her first four pregnancies led to ended in miscarriage, so it was very very tragic, and she was in poor health. They decided to. Uh, John Quincy decided that they would s travel that summer in Silesia. Now today, Silesia is part of Poland, but uh, uh, back it was, it's actually been a very Germanic area. It was part of Germany and it was part of Prussia at this time. And it was considered a you know, very beautiful country or area, region of, of, of what's now Poland. A lot of German-speaking people living there. And during, this was during the summer. I believe there's, it's a mountainous, very beautiful mountainous area. And he, uh, during, that, during their travels in Silesia, John Quincy wrote 43 letters to his youngest brother, Thomas, about their travels, describing the, the land and the people. Uh, Thomas had, them, had these letters published in serial form in a Philadelphia literary magazine. And uh, an unknown person published them in London as a 387 page book called Letters on Silesia, and later there were French and German translations published. All this with, without uh, John Quincy's knowledge. He didn't, he was just writing letters, but you could see he was a very good writer, so it was good that the doct, their doctor had saved his forefinger when he was a boy, the doctor who died at Bunker Hill. 1801, uh, Louis, Louisa finally success, successfully gave birth and uh, to a son, 
whom they named George Washington Adams. Kind of a, uh, well, he was paying respects to George Washington, who had given him his first good job as U.S. ambassador to the Netherlands. So, uh, and, and the, uh, again, this was, in, this was in Berlin, Prussia, and which is now uh, Germany. Uh, uh, Paul C. Nagel, his, the biographer, wrote, wrote this about this time, quote, To assure perfect quiet for Mrs. Adams' a recuperation, the Prussian king ordered all traffic prohibited in the street where they lived. So that was nice. One of the advantages of, of knowing the king, uh, that he could do something like that. And uh, so that was, you know, he did. John Quincy was, you know, knew the king of Prussia because he was the ambassador. In November of 1800, in November of 1800, yeah, this is a few months earlier, uh, his, John Quincy's brother Charles died of alcoholism. So this is very, very tough. His, the, the middle of the three brothers. And around that time, uh, his father had been defeated as, uh, in the U.S. presidential election against uh, Thomas Jefferson, the 1800 election. So this was kind of sad times for their family. Uh, and uh, so that, that meant in early 1801, by March 1801, uh, Thomas Jefferson would be taking office and his father would be leaving the, the White House. And uh, his father decided to recall him. John Quincy was disappointed. He thought, well, uh, well you know, why do, maybe uh, Jefferson would have, would have kept him on. You know, then actually he knew Jefferson. He was, Jefferson was like, had been like a father to him when they, when they knew each other in, 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 in France. But anyway, that was his decision. So he was recalled and he came home to the United States in June of 1801. And they took a ship from Hamburg to Philadelphia. And uh, then he returned to Boston to continue this uh, legal practice, which was, you know, his thing, the, thing, the thing he dreaded in life, practicing law, because it just wasn't for him. Arrived in September. Uh, uh, before that, they, were, they had been in, uh, New, spent some time in New York City, and he had dinner with Aaron Burr, famous Aaron Burr, who was vice president, was killed, who killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel. And then finally, the home in Boston. By December, he was working, you know, and pretty unhappy again uh, as a lawyer, and uh, Louisa was sickly. Now, of course, they had their baby son, George. At night, uh, John Quincy would read Shakespeare, often out loud, to Louisa, as well as his other, one of his other favorites, John Locke. So again, he was kind of, he thought, well, what am I going to do? You know, and not really happy practicing law. And uh, politics was, uh, was very attractive to him. Uh, he was getting involved in community organizations. He helped as a volunteer firefighter at nights and uh, trying to be a good citizen. One of his friends was William Emerson, the father of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And during this time, 1802, uh, Louisa's father died. And she, this was very hard on her because, you know, she was heartbroken. She really admired her father and he was never, he never recovered from his financial catastrophe and because he, he became very depressed. In April of 1802, John Quincy was elected to the Massachusetts Senate. And although he actually never, he didn't, see, he didn't really serve because certainly thereafter he was elected to the U.S. Senate. And during this time, John Quincy wrote this, quote, Liberty, religion, and philosophy are and must ever remain the blessings and ornaments of life. However, they may sometimes get ill-sorted. So you can see he believes in, believed in liberty, religion, and philosophy, freedom. So uh, this was this, uh, you know, so he started his, uh, well, his political career in earnest, and he served for eight years in the U.S. Senate as a senator from Massachusetts, starting in 1803. In uh, July of that year, July 4th, their second son, John, was born. So Louisa was having some success in bringing children, uh, having having uh, pregnancies lead to, to live babies. So they had their second son. Uh, he was having uh, uh, financial problems because uh, partly he actually, his father, John Adams, was you know, older and was relying on John Quincy uh, to uh, manage his money, to help manage his money. And uh, uh, there was a, an investment that went bad that John Quincy had made on behalf of his father. And so uh, he decided he needed to reimburse him for that, so this led to financial problems. In August of 1803, his mother Abigail was sick and almost died. In October 
uh, John Quincy and Louisa moved to Washington City, and he began his uh, work as a U.S. Senator from Massachusetts. He was in the Federalist Party, uh, but he did not tow the party line. He was really very independent. You know, he really believed in doing what was right, or what, what he believed was right, and this led to problems um, in, uh, politically, because guys, when you're in a par- political party, that's not appreciated. They, party loyalty is, is something that's very highly valued for political success of the party. Now, one of the things that was one of the issues, Thomas Jefferson was president, the Louisiana Purchase uh, took place, and uh, the question is, had, it had to be approved by Congress. And the Federalists were against it because they thought it would weaken New England. Federalists were really uh, str- uh, strongly rooted in New England. They were against the, the Louisiana uh, Purchase and voted against it. John Quincy voted for it. He was in favor of it. And he helped, uh, uh, he helped the Senate approve the, Lu- the Louisiana Purchase. And this led to him being unpopular with the Federalist Party and in New England. Another uh, issue came up. There was a, there was a treaty that was up for a consideration that would have given the United Kingdom, Great Britain, a 150-mile strip of land, which is now on the Canadian border, in what's now Washington State, Montana, and North Dakota. And John Quincy Adams fought against this. He was against it because he he thought this should be American territory. And he helped keep that land American. It's called the, the Adams Strip because of the efforts of John Quincy Adams to keep it a part of the United States. In November of 1805, he was hired to teach at Harvard, his alma mater. And this is something that that he did while while continuing to be U.S. Senator. In May, he visited his brother-in-law, William Smith. His sister, Nabby, had married a guy who was no good, William Smith, and he was in debtor's prison. This is another tragic thing for their family, the marriage, uh, the very tragic marriage of his sister, Nabby, to William Smith, who was a a 'er ne'er-do-well. That summer of 1805, John Quincy uh, was enjoying. He had time to read. He was reading some of these great thinkers from the ancient world, including Demosthenes, Aristotle, Cicero, and Quintilian. John Quincy taught at he taught oratory and rhetoric at Harvard for three years. Yeah, so that this was something that he you know, he enjoyed doing. He wrote in his diary. This is a very ex- this extensive diary about his Harvard, all the work he did for these Harvard lectures. He, he felt that he was like Sisyphus from a- ancient Greek mythology, con- condemned to roll a large stone up a hill in Hades, only to have it roll down again every every night, over and over and over. That's this uh, legend. This guy. That's his. That's his punishment in in hell. This character Sisyphus. He rolls a ball up during the day, and, and then it rolls back down every day. He has to roll this ball back up, up this hill. And uh, in, in, in John Quincy Adams' case, he said he took two weeks of hard work for, one ha- for a half-hour class teaching at Harvard. June of 1806, uh, John Quincy was in Boston teaching. Louisa was in, in Washington, and she gave birth to a stillborn child that was, that was dead at, at birth. So this is another tragedy for them. So during these years, his, uh, he, was, uh, he would travel back and forth part of the year. He would, half the year he'd be in Boston teaching at Harvard, the other half in Washington serving as U.S. Senator. In 1806, he was given, as U.S. Senator, he was given $494 to spend in Boston bookstores for books for the Library of Congress. And uh, biographer Paul C. Nagel wrote this quote, Here at last he found public duty and personal pleasure in perfect harmony. So the thing he loved, one of the things he loved, uh, great loves, was going to bookstores and, you know, seeing what they had and looking for, or for interesting books that he could buy. In this case, he could do that and also part of his work as U.S. Senator from Massachusetts. In 1807, in August, Louisa gave birth to Charles, their, their, third, ch- their third son, and, uh, in, uh, and, and John Quincy had this routine. He, from April to October, he taught at Harvard in Boston, or in, in Cambridge, actually, in the Boston area. And then from October to April, he was in Washington City as U.S. Senator. He considered himself a man without a party because of his, uh, yeah, he, he was really, had been sort of shunned from the uh, Federalist Party. It became very unpopular. He was so unpopular that... Uh, 
um, that, that he resigned from the Senate. And the, uh, the thing that the, the, the breaking point was the Embargo Act, which uh, Thomas Jefferson had signed because the, you know, the British were uh, stopping American ships because of their, you know, there was war between Great Britain and France, and the British, uh, the U.S. was trading with both countries, and the British thought, oh, this is trading with the enemy, they're stopping American ships, and still the impressment issue, basically kidnapping American sailors. Now, John Quincy supported the Embargo Act, you know, I think partly because he was, even though his father and Jefferson had become political enemies, but uh, either he believed it was right, and uh, although it turned out to not work at all, but uh, so he actually, he, uh, he had, this was the, the end of his time in the Senate because of this. The Federalist Party completely withdrew his support, and he believed, or he was pressured to resign. And he became a very hated man in Boston, 1808. And he wrote this, quote, It is not magnanimous and certainly not wise to quarrel with human nature for being weak. That a man should be deserted by his friends in the time of trial is so uniform an experience in the history of mankind that I never had the folly to suppose that my case would prove an exception to it. This is the, the advantage of studying history. You can from the, learn from the experiences of others. You know, he, he, he did what he believed was right, and here he was very, very unpopular in Boston, you know, his hometown, really. In 1809, uh, well, he, he continued to, to live, live much of the year in, in Washington. And uh, in 1809, James Madison became the fourth U.S. president, and uh, John Quincy attended the, in the inauguration and the inaugural ball. And he wrote this about that experience, quote, The crowd was excessive, the heat oppressive, and the entertainment bad. So again, he was uh, thought, well, what am I going to do now? He's out, out of the Senate and uh, d- did not want to practice law. Uh, he was uh, President Madison offered him the chance to become U.S. ambassador to Russia. Remember, this is where he had been before. And since uh, he thought, oh, this is, you know, maybe he was nostalgic about his youth, he accepted it. He became U.S. ambassador to Russia. And his parents were very much against it, and uh, Louisa was against it. And uh, Abigail, his mother, wrote this, quote, Both his father and I have looked to him as the prop and support of our advanced and declining years, his judgment, his prudence, his integrity, his filial tenderness and affection, his social converse and information have rendered his society particularly dear to us. So they felt pretty bad. His parents felt really bad. You know, they were getting older, and he was the only, the only son they could rely on. His two brothers, uh, his one brother had died. Charles had already died, and then Thomas uh, eventually, he, he succumbed to alcoholism as well. So this was, but anyway, this is what he decided to do. He served uh, as U.S. ambassador to Russia for five years under President James Madison. He was actually in uh, Russia during the, the Napoleonic invasion of, of Russia, which is depicted in war, the, the great Russian novel by Leo Tolstoy, Roy in, uh, War and Peace. And uh, um, John Quincy, during his time, became good friends with Tsar Alexander I of, of Russia, they sailed for Bo- from Boston on August 8, 1809, and he wound up spending eight years in Europe. Now the, uh, and it was decided that, uh, you know, Louisa came, and they had this one-year-old uh, son, Charles. And, but they, now the thing is, this was, this was a key thing, is uh, George, their son George, was eight years old, and John was six years old. And uh, John Quincy decided that they would stay in Massachusetts so they could go to school. And they did not come. And this was a very, actually, a, you could say a tragic decision, a fateful decision, because these two boys were really, really traumatized. They, you know, they lost it. You know, they're very young, eight and six. And they didn't see their parents for about six years. I think it was six years, yeah. And so, and this was devastating for Louisa to be separated for her two young boys, you know, for, for such a long time. And, uh, the, but this was, you know, John Quincy's decision, you know, he... He, he thought this is what we're going to do, and you know they need to stay behind and go to school, and and uh, he thought it was he thought it was the right thing. I'm sure years later he regretted his decision. John Louisa wrote this at this time: "Quote, oh, it was too hard. Not a soul entered into my feelings, and all laughed to scorn my suffering. Every prepar- preparation was made without the slightest consultation with me, and even the disposal of my children was fixed without my knowledge." 
until it was too late to change. Oh, this agony of agonies! Can ambition repay such sacrifices? Never. And from that hour to the end of time, life to, to me will be a succession of miseries, only to cease with my existence adieu to America. That decision probably, more than anything, was the, led to the biggest problems they had in their marriage because of these, these, young, these boys uh, became very troubled uh, men, and I'm sure it was connected to this. And, uh, you know, and it, it was John Quincy's decision. I'm sure he regretted it. But, you know, the thing is, you have to make a living, and he did not want to be a lawyer, and uh, this, was, uh, this is what he wanted to do. And he, he also believed he was, you know, he was being, uh, his country needed him to do this. Anyway, it was his decision, and this also involved him saying farewell to his Harvard students, and he gave a speech, his final class, he said this, had this to say to his students, quote, I would entreat you to cherish and to cultivate in every stage of your lives that taste for literature and science which is first sought here. I would urge it upon you as the most effectual means of extending your respectability and usefulness in the world. I would press it with still more earnestness upon you as the inexhaustible source of enjoyment and of consolation. In a life of action, however prosperous may be its career, there will be seasons of adversity and days of trial. The trials of prosperity themselves, though arrayed in garments of joy, are not less perilous or severe than those of distress. At no hour of your life will the love of letters ever oppress you as a burden or fail you as a resource. He's talking about how you know books, uh, books are, you know, they, like they say, a good book is a good friend. He continued, quote, I have heard of two lovers who, upon being separated from each other for a length of time and by a distance like that to which I am bound, mutually agreed at a given hour of every day to turn their eyes toward one of the great luminaries of heaven. And each of them, in looking to the sky, felt a sensation of pleasure at the thought that the eyes of the other at the same moment were directed towards the same object. Let us remember the pleasant hours in which we have trod together this path of wisdom and honor. Well, that brought down the house. Uh, there was the kids, all the students, all cheered this and very touching farewell. I, th I thought it was a nice idea. He mentioned, you know, looking at the moon. If, if you're separated from someone, they'll be able to see it as well. So, in August of 1803, uh, John Quincy, Louisa, and their their one-year-old son Charles sailed from Boston to St. Petersburg, Russia. It was an 80-day voyage, and uh, the ship docked, and they barely made it because the, you know, the, 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 the ice was coming. And then the, in fact, at one point, the, they were over, I think, in the Baltic Sea, and the captain wanted to turn around. He said, we can't make it. And John Quincy said, no. And they did make it, although that the ship was iced in for the winter and had to wait. Um, so they, uh, they made it, and uh, they docked opposite the statue of Peter the Great, you know, the guy who the Russian Tsar who had created St. Petersburg. And later it was called Leningrad during the Communist era. Now it's St. Petersburg again. Uh, that statue of Peter the Great had a 25-foot high pedestal and was had a 20-foot high statue. It was actually built by Catherine the Great, and uh, and during the during the Second World War, the uh, the Germans didn't uh, destroy it. I think partly because it had been built under the leadership of a German, Catherine the Great, who was uh, herself German. So it appears we're out of time. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you. I hope you find a, a good his history book to read. Next time we'll continue with the amazing life of John Quincy Adams. Take care, and I'll see you next time.